we are um, safeguarding our, our, our right to our inheritance in this country. And so right now, the work is making sure we're being consistent in terms of defining reparations. Who's it for and for what purpose? We're focusing on our very specific group and we want people within our lineage or our, our ethnicity um, who have been harmed and who are owed a debt to only be involved in that conversation. U.S. In the U.S. It's evident that he cares. What do you care about? Welcome to The Rock Newman Show. It's The Rock Newman Show. Welcome, folks. I am Rock Newman, and this is another version for you of the Rock Newman Show 2.0. Uh, I encourage you, we're going to have a dynamic show today. I encourage you to tune in here, stay with me, tell your friends and family and anyone else in your sphere of influence, uh, hey, Google the Rock Newman Show right now because it's about to be some fire up in there. <laughs> um, I have two guests today that really fit the bill for helping to define that The Rock Newman Show 2.0 is indeed about diversity. My first guest is educator and organizer Jade Harrell. Jade, thank you thank so you. much for being on The Rock Newman Show 2.0. Yes, absolutely, thank you for having me. My that. next guest is ZZ. She goes by the name of ZZ. She said, well, what's her name? ZZ is her name. <laughs> and she is a social commentator. And she will comment, commentate on a bunch of subjects. And we're going to try to cover a bunch of them today. ZZ, thank you for joining us on the Rock Newman Show. Thank you for having me. Tell your dad I want some bean pies. Absolutely. Thank so you very I'm much. On the way. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You see, I've got a full page of notes here. Just all kinds of stuff where I can <laughs> that I want to talk to you guys about. Let's start. Let's start here. Last night, I was at a black tie event. It was a graduation of sorts mm -hmm. for an all girls high school. Kind of up across, if you will, you know, more wealthy families than not, but some scholarships given. Mm -hmm. Primarily Caucasian, but not all. I was there with someone whose family I'm close with that's non-Caucasian. At one point, the mother of the graduating daughter that I was sitting next to pointed out and said, see that girl growing across the stage? In the seventh grade, his, her name was Jeff. But in the ninth grade, Jeff had become Jill. And to the credit of the school, they allowed Jeff, who had changed his gender, gender identity to that of a woman, although there hadn't been any physical changes made, the all-girls school allowed him to come. And last night, he graduated and walked across the stage with his father. That's one thing. Mm. A half a dozen people later, 
she said, now this girl here is non-binary. So I, like, I know I had heard the word. I said, you know, what does that mean? She said, that means that she doesn't identify. And she said, they don't identify as male or female. I text a friend of mine and said, give them the examples. And I said, I'm dizzy. This is, this is making me dizzy. I don't, uh, I don't understand. Do either one of you care to help me try to understand or have comments about what I just said? Well, first of all, um, I feel confused <laughs> as well listening <laughs> to the story, but I actually understand what's going on. Um, children and the society that we live in, we're in 2023 right now, they are allowed to and sometimes encouraged in school and supported in changing their gender identity. So gender is being taught um, as a social construct as opposed to a scientific and biological fact, which I know and believe that your gender, your sex, uh, it's a biological fact. Now, there's a lot of politics around that, and mm -hmm. I will say that that is one of the agendas and reasons as to why I'm no longer a classroom teacher and I no longer am consulting on social justice issues um, within schools uh, or around schools because they are, uh, they have codified this into policies, right? And so, I mean, I've been to places in uh, New York City, like the Department of Education, where they deal with operations, I mean, they were installing gender neutral bathrooms in elementary schools about five years ago. And there was a whole rollout, you know, for that. So, um, yeah, chill, and, and, and also there's policies against parents advocating against this, right? So the way in which I was raised, my community, my values, my spirituality, those things which are non-negotiable, uh, parents um, can be punished if they don't allow their children to switch genders. And schools will enforce that. And some places in the South, like uh, where I currently reside in Florida, it's the opposite. Uh, the DeSantis and the more conservative policy mm -hmm. makers are absolutely discouraging what you say. Um, they're, they're just changing of gender or encouraging even gender being changed is, is a social construct. Now, those conservatives are seem to be fighting tooth and nail against allowing that. Yeah, I think it's two different, it's, it's on two different sides of an extreme. Because even with the uh, trying to harness an idea or trying to grasp the idea of this fluidity and gender, they move the goalposts so much. And so you have a, on the opposite side, which is honestly, all of it's still under the umbrella of white supremacy because the conservatives down there are not, it's not they're fighting for. To, to educate us on our blackness or anything of that sort, you know, mm -hmm. when it comes to consciousness of black people at all. Yeah. But they will insert their opinions when it comes to their uh, disliking of LGBT or gender fluidity or, you know, transgenderism, things of that nature, because it's, it's duality, which is white supremacy, you know? So we're gonna have, we're gonna see them say, no, we can't talk about it at all in schools. You can't do this at all in schools, which to a degree I uh, completely agree with them, if I'm being honest, because pushing that on children, sexuality and different forms of gender, which is, there's only really two, if we're being honest, is a <coughs> bucket of confusion you're dumping on them. There's no way around trying to put one plus one equals two, trying to make it logical when it comes to gender fluidity. Because you have these people who say, just like the, you said it was a, from Jeff to Jill. Yeah. Um, he's a woman, he was in a, an all, that was an all girl school you said? Yeah. An all girl school, and see, there's a, they, they, pl they play on this line where it's like they will allow men into these spaces and say, oh, well, this is equality, this is, you know, this is fair. Women, if these, these men wanna, if these young boys think they're girls, they should be da da da. But there's no responsibility on whether, or on the actions that happen afterwards. Like inside, like these uh, men who are allowed inside women's prisons that impregnated women. There are men who are allowed inside women's prisons that impregnated women. Now they're looking like, oh, well, well I mean, it, 
Well, now there's a stumbling of words because how do you explain? It's not logical for you to allow this man inside a female space and not expect that to happen. That's logical. Of course that's going to happen, regardless if he identifies as he, she, we, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. That is still biological. He's able to impregnate women, especially with that. Even that, that little boy, you said he, that uh, the Jill, Jeff, they didn't have any physical alteration. Uh, um, physical uh, alterations, right. which means he could have easily done that to one of the girls in there. And if that would have happened, now who's to, who's to blame for this? Because he was allowed into that space. So there's no responsibility put on, in no logical sense, really inserted inside the thinking of trying to make uh, boys into girls, girls into boys, and, and allowing this gender fluidity into schools, into a national base. What you do at home is what you do at home. But when you're talking about in a general population, we have to worry about the dangers of other children, children specifically, which are the most unprotected. So, yeah. And you yeah. wanted to say something? Yes, I just believe that any conversations about sexuality um, in a school setting or with adults, like if it's not happening in the household, it's just inappropriate. And I see a lot of these agendas as being a form of grooming. And, you know, it's pedophilia. It's inappropriate for adults to be talking to children about their sexuality. Mm -hmm. Elementary school, middle school, and stuff like that. Now, we had sex ed, you know, when I went to Banneker, and, you know, when I went to Paul, we, we you know, here in D.C., shout out, you know, Washingtonian. Benjamin Banneker. Right, ben <laughs> Benjamin Banneker, <laughs> right. right? High school. Um, yeah, but I think this has gone way too far. And also, this is a part of what our sister Zizi was saying. This is a part of the strategy of white supremacy. Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. teaches us that sexual confusion, right, um, it happens and it, it's used to the benefit of the white supremacists, especially on our population. In terms of what Europeans do, what white folks do, I'm not really concerned about that, but I know that there are detrimental effects for pushing these sorts of uh, gender confusions and sexual identity politics onto children in the black community. I had a recent guest, you guys may or may not be aware of him. His name is Phil Scott. Yes. He had the show to Phil Advise show and now it's the African mm -hmm. National mm -hmm. New Diaspora mm -hmm. News Network. So I had seen a couple of things that, that, that Phil has said. Now on the one hand, he talked very much about traditional family values in the black community. He also talked about what seemed to be a deluge of information, tactics, and strategies that defeminized black men. Yes. And you all say what? Absolutely. Z -Z. Yeah, absolutely. There's a whole agenda. There's always been a I mean, since the beginning of slavery. There's always, since the beginning of colonization, there's always been of a agenda to emasculate black men because they're the head. You know, y'all are the head. So if you destroy the head, the body follows. And so without that protection, without that leadership and that math, that divine masculinity, you know, being ahead of everyone else, there is, it leaves everyone else vulnerable. This is why we get our children in schools, you know, learning this, being attacked with these, uh, this propaganda in schools. This is why we get women, you know, who are allowing this to their children, who are allowing their little boys to be effeminate, who are allowing their little girls to fall into more masculine roles. Because we don't have that balance. There's no balance there when the black man is being promoted, not even just allowed, but being promoted to be feminine, to be um, emotional, to be uh, non-logical, you know, to, to have, to lack leadership skills and be okay with being in the back, to play in the back role, to playing, to letting women lead or to letting children do what they want. There's a promotion of that. Absolutely. Jay? Everything my sister Zizi just said. Um, and also, listen, um, individuals who identify as women now, are trying to um, equate themselves with being like biological women, like natural, you know, women like myself. I was born with ovaries and I have a lot of estrogen. I'd never had a prostate. Um, now, it seems to be like there, there's this sort of gaslighting happening where, you know, if you don't accept this idea that a man can transition into being a woman, he's equally as much as a woman as I, me and Zizi are. Mm. That's considered to be transphobic. And so I just think that, you know, there's, there's a lot going on with these LGBT uh, agendas. And a lot of these uh, organizations that back these LGBT agendas are also trying to funnel money into the black community. Um, in the reparations movement and in other movements, um, and they're still pushing these agendas, and it's just very dangerous. We just have to separate from all of it. Okay, so let me let me deal with this because I, I tried to deal with it um, with Phil when he brought that up because I had I had uh, seen another 
segment that he did where he was railing against Russell Wilson for allowing his wife, Sierra, to come out half naked. Mm. So now, if you want to wear something Jade or you want to wear something ZZ and you are dealing with somebody that's the man in your life at the time, are they allowed to tell you what to wear or what not to wear? Absolutely. I think if he don't got that power, why are you with him? If I'm being honest, he should. He's again, he's the leader. He's your man. That's your protector. And you know, even the way you dress is a form of protection for your man. Mm -hmm. Because she went out there like that. That's a, a, a multi-millionaire football player. Now, if one of these men would have walked up to her, touched her inappropriately says something inappropriate, and he's now expected to protect her. He's now expected to jump up and say, bulk his chest up and say, oh, well, you can't do that to my woman. But mm -hmm. had she not put herself out there in that way, nobody would even probably address her like that. That's Russell Wilson's wife. Oh, but now that's, that don't look like, the way she's dressed, that don't look like Russell Wilson's wife. That looks mm -hmm. like Russell Wilson's little arm candy. Mm -hmm. That looks like Russell's little escort. If we're being honest, you, you're damn near completely naked. <laughs> Literally, with your thong showing. That is not a way that a mother, a wife, a divine woman in her feminine is not going to dress, period. Especially a woman that respects her man, it's not gonna happen. So, by definition, then, then your interpretation of that was Sierra dressed in a way that disrespected herself, disrespected her children, and disrespected her man. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that seems to be rooted in what Phil Scott was defining as more traditional family value in the black community. Mm. Jay? She also disrespected her ancestors in black society in general. Um, even if she didn't have a man or a husband, why would you even want to wear that? Um, right. And when you do have a husband, what you have on under your clothes is for your husband. So um, I just think that, not I think, my position is, and this position will not change, is that black women need to get out of trying to emulate white feminist because mm. that is not empowerment at all. Whew. I am so glad that I have you all here because you all are talking stuff that folks are talking about and hopefully it'll help me understand and help my viewing audience to appreciate um, your points of view. Not that I think everybody would agree with you, so what? But nevertheless, I am very interested in continuing you know, to hear your point. One of the notes that I had made we're in 2023. We have male-female relationships. How is it significantly different now than 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago? What do you see as the big difference? Um... I think the a lot of the problems we've uh, we have now we've already been had. You know, it's just now it's uh, I think it's worse because it's, we're desensitized to it. I think at a time, especially like when you talk about 40, 50 years ago, segregation, things of that nature, there was when we was forced to be more unified. There was a higher standard. You know, even just like we were talking about dressing, the way we dress. The, you look back at pictures from back then, women were not dressed the same. No, we're near the same as what we're dressed now. You know, men didn't even dress the same. The way we carried ourselves wasn't the same. The way we talked to each other wasn't the same, you know. And so now it's been, we've been desensitized, especially through, like you said, feminism, through even LGBT propaganda, through um, the masculinization of our men. There's been a further effort to worsen our problems. So to a degree, some of our problems have been here, just like, especially from 20 years ago, our sister Charles and Ali, she, a lot of the issues we have now was in her book from uh, Black Man's Guide to Understanding Black Woman and Black Woman's Guide to a lot of the problems we have now. That's why it's kind of resurfaces now. She's went viral again, a lot of her clips, because it's so relatable to this day. And then it was so many women giving her pushback because again, it wasn't as, and especially without social media and the internet, it wasn't as seen. It wasn't as promoted, you know, and it wasn't as talked about. So now we have all of these streams of media and we're able to see more blatantly what we're doing. The problems are a little more, have a spotlight on them. But, yeah. That's gracious. <laughs> what do you see as the differences? Well, in your generation, mm -hmm. 
um, and your parents and grandparents generation, we had black marriages. Yeah. And so right now we're seeing a lot of people in our age groups, in our separate generations, who a lot of them come from single, you know, a parent households where a mother was present and a father wasn't present, etc. cetera. Um, so I think that we have underestimated the power of having a black man and a black woman in the family and also being surrounded by other families that were also married, you know, families where parents were, were married. Like my parents were married my entire life until, you know, my father transitioned um, early, you know, unexpectedly. Um, ZZ is also a product of, you know, having her father and her mother, you know, in her life. And so unfortunately, when one parent is missing, you know, especially from the opposite sex, whether this happens to men or women in our community in this younger generation, there's a lot of brokenness. There's a lack of uh, a break in belonging and a lot of confusion as to what your role and your responsibility is within your household and your family and your community. What's your gender role? What, do, what, do, what yeah. are you learning about how to be a woman and how to be a young lady um, from your grandmother and your aunties and your mother and how they related to their husbands? and vice versa for men. So that has been missing and we're seeing the, the residual damage of that. That needs to be corrected. Absolutely, there's a lack of respect, just to add on, a lack yeah. of respect for fatherhood and motherhood and the unification of both. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. And then they're, they're pushing this thing where it's like, it's okay to, you know. You say they're pushing, you're talking about. Uh, uh, society, uh -huh. excuse me, mm -hmm. let me be specific. Uh -huh. So the societal norm in America and in the Western world is that um, you don't necessarily need another parent. You know, you can be a single parent mm. and you can be the mother and the father of the child. And in my humble, maybe not so humble opinion, that is, that is falsehood that is damaging our community. Okay. And so I, we have to normalize, you know, the union between black men and black women if we are going to survive as a people for generations to come. Um, now you're seeing a lot of younger people and the Gen, Gen Z uh, generation mm -hmm. and the millennial generation. I'm a millennial. A lot of us are sort of repatriating back to those old school family values like our brother Phil Scott was talking about because we, you know, we see how um, we are disadvantaged by not having strong black marriages to build generational wealth and legacy. Yeah, there's actually a, a, a movement, sadly, that it's a lot of, and it's a lot of uh, young black men specifically too, that's literally like it's no point in getting married like there's no benefit there's no you know what's the point then you have women on the other side it's like well i'm independent i'm going to wait for a, a, a man who will deserve me who is um i'll submit to this this and this i'll be feminine when this this and that. like there's a lot of conditions on everything now you know there's a lot of the, the standards of everything is changing just like she said single parenthood is at the forefront of families at this point. Even when we look at new films and new uh, cartoons that's coming out for that's quote unquote including diversity for black children, a lot of the parents, it will be one black parent, one non-black parent. Yeah. It'll be a single mom, it'll be a single dad, it'll be a, a mom with who father just died, it'll be a father who lost a mother, something, of, something to that effect just to push that further into our children's head that you don't need both parents. Look how these children grew up, look at, look at the adventures they went through without both parents. Look at what you can do by yourself. And then there's a promotion of you're this strong, you're so you should be praised because you raised your children on your on your own. You did this on your own. You you didn't need anybody. You you didn't have any help. There's like a especially for women, there's a it's like you uh, it's not a, a tangible prize, but there's a there's an untangible um, speaking of praisehood that you get for oh for raising your your children without a father when it's like that shouldn't be something that we look up to it should be something that we should be trying to strive away from to to get away from so we can have a, a healthier balance within the household what message is trying to be promoted with these wives of basketball wives um hollywood atlanta and what little what and i know a just a little bit because it's Seems like a lot of garbage to me. Yeah. But, you know, Nene Leakes comes out and becomes a celebrity because she could cuss harder and snap on people faster than somebody else. And the one, the women fighting. What, what, what are they trying to do? What's Hollywood trying? What's TV trying to do? Yeah, they're promoting vanity and narcissism, period. Mm. 
vanity and narcissism, rugged individualism, look at me, look at me, materialism, and all of those things, none of which are conducive to nation building. So none of those things. Um, <laughs> especially when they do it with women? Especially when they do it with women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because women, you know, your mother's, you know, your first teacher, right? We, mm. we're, we're nurturing, you know, we're carrying life with us for nine months before, you know, babies are born into the world. Like we set an example and we, we get to, you know, hold that line and nurture healthy children that are going to be holistic, you know, connected to their spiritual selves, able to have a level of emotional intelligence and uh, an ability to self monitor and be reflective and to tap into, you know, that aspect of yourself, whether it's, uh, you know, with male children and, fem and female children. But when women are out here just doing themselves and taking on these very hyper masculine and or narcissistic roles, it is destroying black society. And quite frankly, unfortunately, these, you know, that's what Hollywood is, is doing. That's what they're putting out there. We know who owns Hollywood and what they're promoting. Um, but again, it goes back to the, 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 the area of, well, another area of people activity, according to Mr. Fuller, which is entertainment. Right. You know, this this how entertainment is used and propaganda is used to kind of keep us confused and not actively dismantling the global prison system of racism, white supremacy. Absolutely. And it's even heavier with uh, entertainment now they're using because we have social media. Our kids mm -hmm. is on TikTok as soon as they wake up. They're on a the game. They're on TV. They're on, you know, the iPad. They're mm -hmm. on some form of using some form of media entertainment to uh, even to educate themselves, to to uh, entertain themselves. And so that's a major, like that's a major way they're doing it. It's through, it's just through entertainment. Yep. So you mentioned, have mentioned a few times, Neely Fuller. Yes. I recently did an interview with him. You did? Really? I recently did an interview with him. Oh, wow. I can't wait. Let me tell you. I love him. And Neely Fuller <laughs> is about to turn 94 years old. Yes. Sheesh. Yes. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. And I keep hearing some young folks say you got to watch out for these old niggas. Can y'all break that down? What's, what's, what's the root of that? What are they saying? I don't understand. I would like to answer that question, uh, I'm, I'm but I also you. have a question for you. Yeah. How does it make you feel? To hear that, like you to even say, like, watch out for these old niggas. How does it make? And I'm not calling you old, by the way, but uh -huh. it's okay. That? No, I get it. I get it. I get the. I, I get it. Um, you, you know, in my DNA, I'm rooted in my DNA with trying to make sure that I do everything that I can for the rest of my days to uplift my community, to uplift black. Folks, mm. I did some something on here, and you know, I was explaining who I was, and you know, some of the uh, some of the even the humor that I found in folks saying, you know, is that a black is Rock Newman black or oh, mm. whatever, you know, and so I did something, and I kind of showed my history in a collage, and you know, and said, you know, I do my show, and I'm unapologetically in my show and in my life, black 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 black. black. So I have an agenda to help the best I can to improve the lot of black people. So when I hear them say that, I have to take a pause and be like, okay, you say you gotta watch out for those old niggas. Well, the old niggas are people that have gone, have been in the belly of the beast, mm -hmm. have, especially when people have good intentions, and have a certain wisdom that you're not going to have, bro, mm -hmm. at 16 or 18 or maybe even at 28. So when you say you got to watch out for those old niggas, you probably want to listen mm. to them old niggas. That's my response mm -hmm. to how it makes me feel. Mm -hmm. I really want, I wish they didn't feel that way because that in and of itself is a divide. And then people start defending their position. Mm-hmm. So. Dear, thank you. I just wanted to ask you that question just to sort of humanize you because, I mean, I think that it's a very dangerous, uh, not dangerous statement. Well, yes, it is a dangerous statement, straight up. It's just dangerous. Um, I think it's ignorant and I think it's asinine, but I also think it's hurtful. So that's why I wanted you to acknowledge the impact. I didn't want to make any, any assumptions about, like, how mm -hmm. that lands with, with older folks in our, in our community. Mm -hmm. um, I respect eldership. 
that's how I was raised, right? And so the more and more conscious I've become throughout the years, it really only enhanced my principles and the manner in which I was raised, which is to respect uh, those who have come before you, right? Because you all lived in a different world in a different time and even um, something that, you know, a, a deed that we may look at now in 2023, we may say like, oh, that's old people stuff at your, at that time. That was revolutionary for folks, yeah. mm -hmm. right? It was revolutionary for folks to, you know, organize in a particular manner and, and to not press their hair or wear perms to wear Afro. Those were cutting edge revolutionary things and we have to pay homage to those who came before us. Um, I don't like the statement. I don't use the statement. I think it's very, very disrespectful. Um, I, I, I do understand the, the mindset or the logic behind it, which is, you know, some people in the older generation um, are trying to sabotage black progress because they are, you know, conditioned to sort of submit to white supremacy and then mm -hmm. they, you know, use names like, you know, coon or negro pen, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I understand that, but we also have coons and negro pens and the younger generations as well. Um, I just know that even when I don't agree, I, I have, have points of disagreement in terms of the manners and tactics that many older folks have about our liberation and the path forward, I have to respect um, their contributions and the fact that they even have you know, a perspective that I may not agree with. Um, I don't ever think it's appropriate to disrespect older people. Um, and, and I'm gonna land on this. There's elders, they're trying to make a distinction between like there's elders and then there's old people. Mm -hmm. I just see, I see elders as elders, mm -hmm. right? We may not disagree, but it's my responsibility because I'm going to be an elder one day to be respectful and mm -hmm. to be mindful. Mm -hmm. Let me say something to the, to the listening audience and to you guys. My motivation for having both of you on is because as I am 70 years old, I genuinely believe in the principle we're never, never too old to learn. And I find myself learning stuff all the time. And a lot of time it comes through the voice of those who are younger than I am. So this was not some gratuitous, oh, come on. Oh, come on. I, Here's where I here's where I have a lack of um, comfort also in this time and wanting to be appropriate whatever time it is. Don't just come. I'm not looking for somebody to just come on and be a pretty face. I'm looking for I'm looking for someone who can come on and have substance. And so after listening to hearing you guys over a period of time. My producer Avis, he talked about you guys being on years ago actually, mm -hmm. already. And I wanted to be more become more familiar. And I really respect what you all are doing. So I'm saying to my I'm saying to my audience, those that are in my generation, older or younger, the Rock Newman Show 2.0 is about a wide range of opinions. And it is an honor for me to have these two ladies here. I told somebody yesterday in a text that I said, you're an amazing and wonderful woman. She wrote back and said, you're an amazing and wonderful man. Now, I didn't know if my saying woman, if I should have said lady. So, I, you know, I'm getting, what, what do y'all think? It, 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 what do you want somebody, how do you want, to, how do both of you want to be addressed? In whatever age you are and whatever age you are. <laughs> um, I'm okay with uh, some of the names that brothers use, like beautiful or, you know, sweetheart or, you know, like I'm, I'm fine with stuff like oh, that. that, that you know, that's that's sure my generation, or at least it's me. <laughs> I'm sweetheart. I, I, I'm sweetheart, honey pie, sugar. I'm all that, you know. I'm okay with and that. If, and if anybody takes any offense at that, it's not intent. It's it's so sure not intent. You know, I was I was reared to be a gentleman. I open car doors. I stand to the side of the street that's closest to the car, 
And I was also taught by my eighth grade civics teacher. If a woman, if the lady that you're with is going up an escalator, you stand behind her. So can't nobody see up her dress from behind. And if you're coming down, you stand in front of her in case she trips, you're able to brace her. I mean, I got those things rooted in here. I don't know why I need to talk about that because I'm not the guest you all are. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, I like, yeah, the terms like ZZ mentioned, also um, queen, you mm. know, um, lady, you know. Um, you know, I'm really averse to being called a girl. I'm not going to call a black man a boy. Mm -hmm. I just think that's very, you know, disrespectful. Mm -hmm. But I also noticed that when people, black and white, refer to white women, they'll say that white lady. But when they refer to black women, they'll say black woman. So, uh, you know, I, I've noticed like, th that Dis distinction, distinction and that, that nuance. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just, as long as it's respectful, don't call me a chick. You know, or or anything disrespectful. Don't call me a girl, and you know we cool. Say anything. Yeah, and let me uh, say this though, because it's, it's going to uh, bother me if I don't get it out though, because I agree with what you said about the young, the old nigga thing. However, I do think there's a a bit of resentment, justified resentment, in a lot of young niggas that's uh, or young men. Let me say that a lot of young men because <laughs> they're so <laughs> because of the lack of. Um, guidance from a lot of black men you know there's yeah. a lot of you know it's like a lot of a lot of older men and like you said is they're trying to make a distinction between old niggas and elders you know because a lot of young men will have respect for what they consider elders versus mm -hmm. old niggas you know but it seems like the ones that they consider old niggas to them they step in and um try to put their foot down when it's too late you know it's like now i've been doing this 15 16 20 30 years and now you're telling me oh you're not supposed to do this oh you a brother you on the wrong path when it's like bro what was you when i was 10 what was you when i was learning when i was going through boyhood when i was going through adolescence when i was becoming a young man when i was when i needed that real guidance and now i'm a man and now you're telling me that i need to switch paths to do whatever when it's like well i've made it this far to a lot of young men you know they're like well i've made it this far and i've done better than these peers or I've made I've survived this or I've done this for my family and so they feel justified and to a degree which they are you know and their resentment against wanting to follow that leadership of old names but I do think like you said there should be regardless there should be a, a standard of respect because regardless of what we think they was back in the 60s they didn't fight hard enough they were coons they still survive you know uh, the system of white supremacy is no joke that was not something easy to go through we can put in what ifs and what i would have did and how i would have did it but you didn't live through that these oh, brothers did oh yeah know? oh that, yeah that oh when i hear the comment huh, they better be glad they better be glad <laughs> i wasn't no slave because if i was a slave yeah okay okay yeah yeah, yeah. so you know which which, which brings me to something else that we, we a, t a term we've all used. Uh, there, there is someone that I'm watches my show. I appreciate that they continue to watch, although I get some pretty heavy criticism from them. And one of the most pointed criticism was at some point that I used the word nigger. Hmm. And, you know, they described how painful, how, how hurtful, that that term has been and it should never be used in any context i ask the question uh uh to you all uh because i wanted to understand the phrase watch out for those old niggas what that what that meant you all have responded and each have used the word mm -hmm. so tell me how you feel about the use of the word? Um, I don't use the word as a term of endearment. So when I use it, I'm definitely referring to, you know, the stereotype of what that word represents with me understanding the history of that word. So what I will say is, you know, publicly and, you know, in my day to day life, you know, I have to work really hard not to use the word because it's been all over the media. It was all in the music, you know, that, that I was listening to growing up in the 80s and 90s. And so there has there's been this sort of mental deconstruction process of sort of cleaning that word out my system. Mm -hmm. I do acknowledge that it is hurtful. It has a it, it's a, a harmful word um, and I don't. I, I believe that it's counter-revolutionary. And I think that um, using the word, especially for me, 
Well, first off, there's only one form of respect. And Mr. Fuller also teaches us this. There's only one form of respect, and that's self-respect. So if I respect myself, I'm not going to identify with any degrading terms. And I'm not going to project that onto my brothers and sisters that I love. So that's my general synopsis about you know that term. And it also, if someone isn't respecting himself, if they are a proverbial nigger, then I don't have to double down on that and disrespect them or be discourteous to them because out of their, their lack of uh, self-respect. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up uh, Dr. Millie Fuller because, you know, uh, he also said nigga doesn't really have a definition. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the power in words is that, you know, they can throw that on us because they can change, move the goalposts of what it means all the time. Um, so I've definitely had that's a, a... That's interesting. Yeah. I had, <laughs> I had not heard that, but that's interesting. Yeah, he said that. And it's, um, it's a, so it's a bit of a confliction because we do hear it all the time. And, you know, it's become a part of our culture that we use it as a ter term of endearment, as a term of uh, hatred. insulting hatred. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so it can be conflicting. And, you know, whether you use it, I grew up with my father saying, that's nigga shit. Oh, you, you know, those some niggas. So he used it as a term that was uh, far from endearing. You know, that was you know that was something to be looked down upon. And so I've always had that programming as well. But as I go through, as I've went through life and learned that so many people, so many, so many of us have used that as a form of uh, to show love, to show brotherhood, to show sisterhood, to show you know love within our community. It becomes a bit conflicting, you know, and that's where being on code comes in because we have to make a decision on what we're going to go with that. You know, mm -hmm. we can't have this confusion that keeps us in a cycle of, you know, confusion without any real distinct terminology or definition for it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And the word was termed obviously not by Africans who came here against their will. Mm. The term was coined by those who brought Africans here against their will, white people. And so I didn't know we would even be having this conversation, but I do want to say something for white folks who are watching. And that is, we think we have a pretty good idea of your definition of a nigga. And... I think the reality is that there is some projection going on from when you first turn, coined the phrase to today, projection. Because the behavior of those that you use that term against, that how you try to define them by what they do, calling them a nigger, you the nigger. By your own definition, white folks, you are the nigga. That's what I said here today on Rock Newman's show. <laughs> that's 2.0. Yeah. If you want to know what I think, that's what I that's what I think. So, um, mm -hmm. huh? I said, mm hmm Yeah, I'm, I'm still with the whole amen thing. Okay. Um, says something we can talk about. I'm this color. And black. You that color and black. Mm -hmm. You that color and black. Mm. Avis is over there is about eight shades darker than you. And <laughs> he is black. Something that we have all something from the my first, very first memory in my life, memories, had a lot to do with colorism. Mm -hmm. Where People in my family, my, my, my mother, her brothers and sisters, with my aunts, uncles, they were a group of people, you may or may not know this, in Southern Maryland, that referred to themselves as Weasels. That was Proctor, Savoy's, Harley's, Newman's, something else. And we sorts meant, I learned later on, meant we ain't black and we ain't white. We are we sorts. We sort are different than white, mm -hmm. different than black. So they call themselves we sort. I'm going to say something else, ZZ. You might not know anything about this. You're, a little, you're the youngest one <laughs> sitting here amongst I'm us. I'm learning. I'm going to But it. <laughs> I went to an elementary school, Orm Elementary 
where this community of resorts lived nearby and around. I saw more albino kids in elementary school from the first to the sixth grade than I have seen for the rest of my life out in society. Mm -hmm. And that came from some intermarrying mm -hmm. because there was pressure among these light-skinned families to make sure that they don't bring no black baby into that light-skinned gene pool. Um, so colorism. It is something that I'm dealing with in my book. Mm -hmm. I'd like for y'all to speak on your experiences and your thoughts about it. You were just saying something. Um, well, colorism, it's, it's, see, it's, I think it's very, um, and it's interesting because it's, it's kind of different on both sides of the goalposts for men and, and black men and black women. Mm -hmm. um, because although there is like distinctions in colorism for light skin and dark skin, there's different aspects on both sides. So like for light skin black men, you know, they're seen as the, uh, there's a whole thing about them being the weak ones or being the fragile ones, being the more feminine ones. And then if you're dark skin, you're attached to masculinity, you're attached to toughness, you're attached to, you know, hardness. And on the other side for black women, it's the same, but instead the light-skinned women, they get the femininity. They're seen as more feminine. They're seen as more uh, likable. They're seen as more ladylike automatically. It doesn't matter, really matter what their behavior is just by looking at them. And then the dark-skinned women automatically get attached to toughness and darkness. And to a degree, um, for the men, the men on the dark skin side, that can be a plus for them. To a degree, you know. A plus at, a plus for the men. For the men, you know. Yeah, okay. But for the okay. women, it's not because that's a turnoff for men. Men are not looking for hardness, they're not looking for toughness and masculinity. So when you attach that to dark skin in general and dark skin women get that label on them, they're yeah. seen it's the interactions are different, you know, whereas women on both sides, light skin and dark skin, might be attracted to the dark skin man because it's, uh, uh, because he's attached to masculinity and toughness and hardness. On the other side, black, dark skin, black women aren't in the same light. You know, mm -hmm. they're not feeling the same attraction. They're getting mm -hmm. that same attraction because they're, that's not a quality that men look for in women, mm -hmm. you know. And so it's hard um, on both sides, you know. However, I don't know, for myself, it, it's weird because I don't know, I've been called, uh, I grew up in the South for a long time, for like 10 years, I was living in North Carolina for like 10 years, so it was, uh, I've been called light skin, I've been called brown skin, kind of in the middle, because I get darker in, in, the, in the summertime, mm. um, and so I've kind of been uh, a bit on both sides, but I can't really speak for dark skin, I can't, I can't really speak for that experience because I'm not, you know, I haven't been subjected to, you know, that sort of color, that sort of extreme colorism, because mm -hmm. that's the, I mean, the dark you are, really what it is is rooted, rooted in anti-blackness, you know, and so mm -hmm. some people see me as a little bit lighter, they see my freckles and be like, oh, you're, you, you must be, you got some white in you, you got some something in you, you, oh, you mix, you gotta be mixed with something, yeah. you gotta be, you know what I'm saying, there has yeah. to be something else yeah. there, and so yeah. I'm fighting to be like, no, my, both my parents are black, you know, yeah. my family went to North Carolina, South Carolina, both my parents mm -hmm. from here, you know, that's, 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 there is no other, people in my, in my family. And so other, you know, I could imagine for other light-skinned women, but there is no, I don't think there's a comparison or there's a, a, a equality when it comes to dark skin and light skin because dark skin, there's, I mean, the blacker you are, the more attached to blackness you are. Mm -hmm. And that's always gonna put you at the bottom of the barrel. So I don't think there, you know, there's a fight for light-skinned women that's kind of like, oh, well, I went through colorism too, you know, and it's like, there's a bit of privilege that's attached to that, although it's still mm -hmm. in the realm of colorism. It's still privilege attached to that because you're attached to more uh, non-blackness or whiteness. You're mm -hmm. you're more privy to that. You're closer to that idea mm -hmm. in most people's minds. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> when I was growing up, they used to call me light skin, white skin. Light skin, white. Light skin, skin white skin. Um, my parents were very adamant and intentional about telling me not to think that I was cuter, better, smarter, or anything other, you know, than anybody else in our community because I was light skinned. Mm -hmm. So they went out of their way to drill that in me, but the world treated me differently. You know, I got different privileges. I was, you know, I, I was picked for stuff first mm -hmm. um, in school and even like in the job. Like it's really crazy. So 
you know, I have benefited from, unfortunately, I've benefited from colorism, but I've also been super duper black because black is a consciousness. It's in our DNA. It's mm -hmm. our ancestral, you know, it's our lineage. Mm -hmm. So I will be like the light skinned person that gets into spaces and then raise hell, pulls in that turn or raises mm -hmm. hell. <laughs> Just, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Exactly. <laughs> but. I think that as a light-skinned person, it's very, very important that we raise light-skinned children to not um, abuse their light-skinned privilege. Like, that is actually a thing. Now, are light-skinned people looked down upon and, you know, singled out or made fun of for being light-skinned? Yes. Is it anything in comparison to what a darker-skinned brother or sister goes through? No. So, you know, I, I feel a responsibility to make sure that, you know, we're, we're being equitable in terms of how we're looking at colorism. Uh, I can't, I'm not going to weigh, you know, um, you know, my racial trauma, you know, on the same level or the same scale as a darker skinned brother or sister because the world treats them differently. And those stereotypes are inherent in media, you know, just all throughout society and even on the interpersonal level and on the internalization level. Mm. So let me share this with you guys. Um, I certainly have been mostly characterized as radical and um, lots of folks, including in my family, talk about my talking about race too much. Why you make so much about race and um, a guy was on the show one day. He's a professor out of New York. Ron Daniels. Y'all know Ron Daniels. Oh, yeah, I know Dr. Daniels. Sir. And he said casually, <clears throat> well, Rock, you know, you're a race man, so you know about this and this and that. And then he said something else, and they came back and said race man again. Now, I've heard that term many times, you know. But I had never really looked it up. And I looked it up, and it talked about a race man is somebody who is most concerned about his race first. Mm -hmm. Everything related thereto mm -hmm. first. Mm. Like, oh, okay. Uh, oh, okay, that's me. So one of the things that I know rat has radicalized me was being in situations, whether it was on a little league team in baseball, whether it was being in junior high, high school, being in meetings, important meetings where people didn't know I was black mm. and they talked in a very open and unguarded way, mm -hmm. not in a way that they would have spoken really to either of you. So I've seen too much mm -hmm. of the raw, naked racism. So my meter, my racism meter is up there somewhere. Why? Because I've seen it raw, un, unvarnished, unblemished, just raw. Mm. So I just want to share that with you, that, that, that that's something, that's an experience that somebody like myself, like, there are times, so, so, so if, if my best friend and I, who is darker than anybody in this room and darker than anybody else in the world, <laughs> If we go into a store, he might much more likely will experience racism than I will. I'll go walk freely and, you know, mm -hmm. six guards might be looking at him and the cameras are pointed on him. So I don't get that, but I understand it because I, I know what our people are subjected to. And on the flip side of that is I have a unique, and somebody my color has a unique understanding of how too many white folks really feel. And that's what you want to know. You want to know how folks really feel. So this, this issue of colorism across the board is a dynamic one. I'll be saying a whole lot about it. Yes, um, absolutely. I want to read about your book. Yeah. In, in, sure. in my book. As we wrap up here, um, I, want to put a, I want to put a matter out there. A couple of years ago, I did a Zoom 
Um, and it was when the time when Kamala Harris had been nominated to be the vice president from Howard University, and it was a, a big uh, conglomerate of Howard University folks that were supporting her. And I wore a black woman rock mask. Mm -hmm. And it was my way of paying tribute to and honoring black women from the days of enslavement to today. So I want to ask you guys, speak on black women's impact, past, present, and future. Well, I mean, the black woman, like you said before, black woman is the first teacher. Um, after, even Elijah Muhammad said, if you want to teach a nation, teach a woman, you know. Um, so the black woman has always had a heavy impact on the culture, on the, um, the education, the uh, overall culture. You know, we cultivate the culture. You know, we pass that on. Um, a lot of that begins with us. And so... To a degree, we, we deserve, uh, not even to a degree, we do deserve praise because a lot of the reasons why we do have some parts of our culture still intact is because of us, you know, it's solely because of us. But there also is, you know, there's positives and negatives to it because certain parts of our culture is because of us as well. You know, one of the reasons, like we was going back to earlier, the reason why Sierra feels comfortable coming out like that and making songs like this goes out to all the all the independent women and why these women look the Nini links why these women have platforms why black women follow them is because of a culture we've cultivated we've allowed to happen um, and be desensitized to that is degrading to us you know and on the other side of that of course we still have to uh, acknowledge those of us who has you know had sense you know like our sisters. It's the Shaharazad Ali from Betty Shabazz to, you know, all of our, all of the sisters leading up to now that we can still look back on, even if we don't have many today, that has set a precedent for us to go by. You know, so black women, we have, um, we have set the standard, you know, we will continue to, I just hope that we continue to push it forward, push it upward, you know, um, because many of us are going astray, you know, which is sad, but Surely enough of us, I think there is enough of us now that have um, seen the problems, that see the problems and are in process of correcting it, so. Jay, given time, mm -hmm. let me get to you on this because part of what just has um, impressed me about observing you over the years since I've become familiar with your name and, and with your work uh, is something that um, I'm highlighting almost on all the shows that I do, getting, getting some comment, getting some commentary, getting some opinions, suggestions. Um, and that's about the subject of reparations. Mm -hmm. you've, you've, done, you've done a lot of work. Yes. Talk to me about what you're doing and what you want to see happen as far as reparations are concerned. Thank you for this question. Um, I will say that my work... And on this topic really started when I was like in high school, when Randall Robinson, may he rest in peace, he's a new ancestor now, he transitioned when he wrote the book, The Debt. I wrote to him and he gave me an opportunity to volunteer at Trans Africa Forum that I spent a considerable amount of time on the topic of reparations from a very Pan-Africanist uh, point of view. Um, right now, we are defining what we mean specifically by reparations as a, as a community and we're focusing on lineage-based reparations, mm -hmm. right? When we're talking about U.S. politics, U.S. society, we're putting our ethnicity first, mm -hmm. those of us whose ancestors, you know, were victimized in the, the, the slave plantations and the killing fields of America, we are um, safeguarding our, our, our right to our inheritance in this country. And so right now, the work is making sure we're being consistent in terms of defining reparations. Who's it for and for what purpose? We're focusing on our very specific group and we want people within our lineage or our, our ethnicity um, who have been harmed and who are owed a debt to only be involved in that conversation. U U.S. In the U.S., absolutely, right. but mm -hmm. reparations also happens like on a global scale, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. like the, the should happen on, should the, happen on right. a global scale. Mm -hmm. Every black person um, on the planet should be in an unwavering, unrelenting fight against white supremacy, 
right, globally. And so we are all owed a debt. But when we're talking about U.S. politics right now, a lot of the advocacy work has been in us defining who we are as a lineage, as an ethnicity, as black Americans. People use the terms, you know, foundational black Americans, indigenous black Americans. Um, you know, Dr. Carl Anderson has done a lot of work um, you know, within this movement as well through the Harvest Institute. So right now, the work is making sure that our data and numbers are delineated or disaggregated from the general black population so we can see how many of us are still alive, right. that are still surviving, that came from this lineage, you know, and this um, experience of enslavement um, and, and making sure that we get the debt, the, the debt paid to us and making sure that organizations um, that are owned and operated and run by white folks or folks who are not of our lineage are not able to manipulate and hijack our reparations claim. We're seeing that happen right now. Right. There's a big thing going on with the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, where they're coming, they're trying to figure out all of the different terms for black folks to check off, you know, for the census. Mm -hmm. And we're saying that we want our ethnicity to stand out because we need to, we need that data. We need to be disaggregated from everyone else so we can get our, our claims. So that's that's where we are right now currently in the reparations movement. Also, there's uh, these reparations task force and hearings that are popping up. I know uh, D.C. Councilman Kenya McDuffie has a bill that he also reintroduced for a task force or around reparations. We just need to make sure that no other group um, is defining what our reparations claim is and our justice claim is, and we need to make sure that it's safeguarded and, you know, gate kept. So I'm going to continue advocating. I'm going to be looking at the policy, looking at this um, with other folks around the country, but there's a lot of work to be done, and unfortunately, a lot of people are on the same page, and there is a movement that you may not be aware of to remove the term black from our ethnicity oh, yeah, and using that. vague terms, right? Such as freedmen or peoplehood and these sort of terms that other groups can kind of weasel their way into. Um, you know, you have white folks claiming that they're freedmen because their ancestors were enslaved in Ireland. Ain't got nothing to do with us. I mean, cut the check. We want our money. Um, a little birdie told me you're writing a book. <laughs> yes, sir, I am. Uh, you were Corey earlier before the show when I asked you what it was about. Um, when can we uh, look forward to seeing it? You can look forward to seeing it in December 2023. So it's being written this year. Um, and I'm not going to say the title yet, but I do have a title. Uh -huh. And the book is really about our ways of being and virtues that are necessary, virtues that are necessary as we are um, advocating for justice within our community. What are the ways of being? How do we need to show up internally? What healing work um, do we need to do around our own trauma that's really going to propel us in order to be holistic in our approach to getting this work done? Right now, I'm seeing uh, a lot of uh, poor decorum, poor behavior, you know, folks whose hearts are in the right place and minds who are in the right place that have a lot of knowledge. However, the manner in which um, they're showing up and advocating for the cause is kind of kind of counterintuitive spiritually. Um, and this book also helps to heal that burnout. So it's going to be really exciting this year. I want to promise that you'll come to me real soon when that book is done. Absolutely. Yes, thank sir. Thank you so much for thank being on the show so today. Much. That's Jay and ZZ. Yes. ZZ, thank you so very much, folks. That wraps up another show of The Rock Newman Show 2.0. See you the next time. God bless.